Thanks, our speaker. I'd like to mention next month's program, which will be at the Interface Center, and it will be Jim Kimball from the college, who's a folk uh, music expert, talking about music in Livingston County. So we hope you'll join us. Now it's my privilege to introduce Tom Roth. He's the uh, historian for the town of Leicester. He's a history buff. I understand that he did this speech at the Dam series. Mount Morris Dam. How many heard that? How many have yeah. heard his speech over there? And he said it was excellent. Uh, he also has a speech about uh, the Erie and Lackawanna Railroad, I guess. But he's also very much involved with uh, the 104th uh, Regiment of uh, New York Regiment, Regiment in the Civil War and knows about many of the soldiers that served in there. He, and so if you've got relatives, he probably knows them because talk to him about that. So it's my privilege to pre present Tom Roth, who's going to talk to us about the Sterling Mine. And I see we probably have some miners. How many are miners? Good. Okay, Tom, let's hear it. <laughs> And uh, 
not all of them survived very long. Uh, some of them had just a, a short uh, span of months. But uh, another one that uh, later in the 1890s, the uh, uh, John White was a predominant uh, farmer in Leicester. He invested quite a little money and started a uh, salt brine well of his own. Now this was located on the upper Mount Morris Road. And if you know where Brian's Diner is, on Route 36, if you go just west of that, up on the hill, that's where this operation was centered at. Uh, as you can see, he's got the steam going here. They're, they're cooking the water off. A little bit bigger operation. Uh, White Salt Mine here, or the Lackawanna Salt Company, in their day, they were producing about 300 barrels a day and uh, 23 gallons of water would produce uh, one bushel of salt. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, they were uh, uh, pretty successful in their day, but they couldn't survive very well, very long. Principally because there was so much uh, labor intensive and so little uh, 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 production of salt that you got out of it. And the other reason was there were so many different uh, competitors that had started up all over, uh, you know, Preferred, uh, Red Sox, Lakeville, uh, Wyoming County, just everywhere, and they, or they basically run each other out of business by overproducing. So, uh, they knew they had a, uh, with salt, they knew they had a, uh, a, a lucrative uh, business here. Um, this Cottywell map, uh, just to give you an idea, of 1902, uh, as I said, this is a road from Geneseo and there's the National Hotel there, and the Pennsylvania Railroad, and on up to Leicester. Uh, uh, just an idea, uh, down here in the corner is the Ziegler Salt Works, and at that time, that had to have been a brine uh, operation too. However, I've never yet found anything whatsoever in terms of history or information uh, concerning the Ziegler Salt Works, so I really don't know anything about it. Now, um, the other reason, um, uh, I've got this cotton kind of map up here, is to give you just a quick rundown. Uh, the background history of Kylerville was centered upon what is here, the Pennsylvania Railroad. Before that was the Genesee Valley Canal. And the Genesee Valley Canal came to uh, <coughs> Kylerville in operation in uh, 1840. And of course, at that time, Kylerville was just a, uh, a farm community. Uh, uh, Mr. Kyler there, Colonel Kyler, had a number of distilleries there and barns. And there really wasn't much of a village there, but the canal really turned it into a thriving little village. Of course, with the canal, well, Kylerville was, was principally settled with uh, Irish and Scottish uh, people of uh, oh, descent there. And uh, of course, they were industrious farmers there. They were pretty happy with their little village. And when the canal came through, it brought in a whole slew of Irishmen. And of course, uh, being part Irish, I've got no problem with the Irishmen. But uh, the people of Kylerville had a, uh, a, uh, quite a time accepting the Irish because of their wild and, and lawless, uh, in their terms, and godless in some, in some opinions, uh, way. So they, they had uh, uh, quite a time accepting the Irish influx into their community, but little did they know what was in store for them. So, okay, uh, as we move on, uh, the Sterling Salt Mine came to be, uh, 1905. Um, I got this letterhead up here uh, principally to show you, uh, of course, uh, the shipping station was Haylight Village. Uh, we'll get to that a little later. And this uh, Vice President Featherston here. Uh, I thought this would be a good point just to mention that Featherston, he wasn't a local person. He was a, a, a trained, a renowned engineer, had a long career of uh, exceptional uh, accomplishments. But in the nine years that he was uh, vice president of the Sterling Salt Mine, he took in, uh, uh, was very involved with the local community. As you can see, he was president of the Livingston County Historical Society for a time. 
uh, the National Bank and the uh, Genesee Country Association, which was the forerunner of the, uh, like the uh, National Park Service. <coughs> and they developed a lot of things in this area, especially Larchworth Park, uh, for tourism and uh, for the uh, uh, community to enjoy and recognizing uh, uh, the historical importance of it all. He also was responsible for, uh, while president of the Historical Society, he was responsible for uh, developing the uh, uh, Boyd Parker Park in Cotterville and establishing the park down there. And the, uh, the whole other story into itself is the 1927 uh, memorial uh, uh, recognition of the uh, Sullivan Clinton campaign and also the 1929 uh, anniversary of the campaign and the statewide pageant program that they did in, uh, in uh, Cotterwell in recognition of that uh, event. So anyways, okay, yeah. uh, the Sterling Salt Mine was initially constructed in uh, 1905. Uh, they started the, uh, well, it was formed in 1905. It was formed with the uh, uh, investment of uh, a group of uh, New York City businessmen and they put up a million dollars and in the spring of 1906 they started construction on the mine shaft and as you can see uh, uh, of course in those days they didn't have the heavy machinery it was all labor intensive the workers the huge uh, scaffolding they uh, put up uh, the shaft itself was all poured concrete all hand done it stood 150 feet tall, which, as you can tell, was quite an impressive building for its day. In the spring, uh, while they were constructing the, uh, the uh, mine shaft building, they also started the drilling. And by that time, they were down to 600 feet uh, to, uh, to uh, install the shaft work. And uh, right off the bat, they didn't have uh, good luck. Uh, one of the first things in February of 1906, uh, they had a, a gas explosion which, uh, which burned 50 of the employees, uh, but no fatalities, uh, thankfully. Uh, just another view of the opposite side of the building, give you an idea of uh, uh, the massive uh, construction. Uh, you can see it very well. There's a nice uh, railroad car down there, and uh, the scaffolding and such. And uh, uh, pretty much close to the end of construction, a little bit of top work to do here yet. Uh, this is a powerhouse building and the, uh, this, the uh, smokestacks for the uh, boilers, uh, coal-fired boilers for power. Um, by November of 1906, they were able, they had the mine uh, uh, shafts in place, they were able to um, uh, produce enough salt, they made their first salt shipment, and by the end of the year they employed 150 men, and they were producing 50 railroad cars of salt a day. Mm. And just a couple of years later, by 1908, total production for that year was 237,000 tons. So they didn't waste any time uh, getting everything up and running quickly. Um, as I said, the, uh, the the mine was constructed on the Wooster Farm. This was the Wooster Farmhouse. They uh, kept that intact and used that for, initially they used that for uh, their main offices, uh, a boarding house for dignitaries of the company, uh, engineers, uh, that type of thing. It was a fantastic old place. Uh, unfortunately though, it, uh, it uh, had a bit of a fire and it was demolished in 1933. So, that's uh, just one of the things of the mine that no longer survived. A couple of construction pictures that are interesting simply because uh, at, the, at that time they were using the most modern of equipment and methods. This uh, steel framework here is going to be a huge warehouse for the storage of salt. Uh, of course, you got the mine shaft in the background, they got a steam. Uh, uh, engine there for uh, uh, operating their tools and equipment and such. Uh, obviously, they didn't uh, pay too much attention to uh, safety on their uh, jobs. Right there. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Uh, just a, another idea, uh, getting closer to the end, they still got their steam machine there, and they got a steam shovel, and uh, just uh, some unique pictures that, uh, uh, you know, the construction and the operation of the mine that uh, reflect on the time gone by. Uh, I don't know how well you can read that unless you're right up close to it, but I did come across a uh, blueprint of the mine area. This will give you an idea. Down at the bottom is the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, there's that warehouse they were constructing. Uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad, of course, uh, had a spur line off of the Kyleville track up to the mine track. And as you can see, they got three or four or five feeder lines to it. So it was a big active operation. Uh, this was storage sheds. This is the big main uh, cement uh, mine shaft building we've been looking at. Uh, up here is the Wooster House and the Wooster Barn. Uh, this little building is the employee's uh, uh, barn and shed. And this up here is the employee's auto shed, which leads me to wonder how many of them had cars. Uh, but apparently somebody must have. And what they call the Sterling Avenue at that time was now River Road in Tylerville. So just to give you an idea of the layout and how extensive it was. Uh, this was a Wooster barn. Uh, that stood until about 1980 when it deteriorated to the point they just knocked it down. Uh, it's, a, it's a neat, uh, you know, the Woosters had uh, quite a farming operation and made money at it. And uh, for those of you that know barns, this was a Wells construction barn. And uh, just, uh, you know, with the, with the high uh, bending cupola there, uh, just a nice uh, sample of barns. But here again, that's gone too. That's all right. That's fine. Uh, an early picture, 1908 picture, <laughs> this when they got started, of uh, the miners themselves. Now, of course, <clears throat> the early miners were uh, principally Italian. Uh, the immigrants uh, settled there in uh, Cotterville to work the mine. Uh, there was a large share of uh, Polish people, Russian people. Uh, Eastern European, Hungarians, uh, all, just all types of immigrants that uh, had to uh, basically uh, work together and live together and try and get along, which uh, uh, wasn't easy whatsoever. The Kylerville in the early years of the mine had a lot of difficulties uh, yeah. with a lot of uh, uh, personalities, let's say. Uh, in early newspaper accounts, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, Assaults, murders, uh, shootings, uh, of course, the miners, they worked hard, they played hard, uh, so they did a lot of uh, things or had a lot of vices that weren't exactly uh, church going type people. Now, that doesn't include all of them, of course. A lot of them were fine, upstanding citizens and still are. But uh, you're always going to get, uh, you know, the rowdy types that, uh, that uh, like to entertain themselves in a rough manner. However, uh, as you can see, the miners, uh, this guy's got a, a pick shovel. Uh, they got early hats with the early lighting systems. I'm not sure exactly what type those are. I haven't done that, uh, you know, that much research into it yet. But uh, everything in those days, of course, was done by hand. Everything was uh, dug out, hammered out, explosives, uh, uh, carts, uh, all hand uh, filled and operated. They also had uh, in the mine uh, in those days, they didn't have the electricity, uh, steam power to any great extent. So all the, uh, the cars of salt and the mining operation uh, was controlled by uh, mule teams. And of course, the mules they took right down into the mine and they lived in the mine. Uh, these stalls right here, as you can see, are rock walls or salt walls. Uh, the mules all stayed in the mine 24 7. They had their own. Uh, uh, exercise area, they had their own blacksmith, uh, uh, they had their stalls, uh, they just lived there until they no longer could work. But, <clears throat> of course, it wasn't easy to work with mules. There is an account uh, where they were taking one mule down on the, uh, on the shaft, along with four men with it, and the mule got uh, fired up there and started uh, raising a ruckus and got kicking and carrying on, and uh, one of the guys was injured so badly by the mule that he died from it. Mm -hmm. 
So there wasn't anything, uh, when you went to work on a daily basis in the mine, there wasn't anything that was safe about it or guaranteed that you weren't going to make it through the day without death or injury. Did the uh, mules go blind for being down there? I have read that, uh, that uh, especially in the early days, like I said, they had very limited lighting down there. And I have read that the mules uh, went blind. I don't know, you know for certain to what extent, but that's, that's what I was told. Uh, this is a relic from one of the early salt shafts. It's uh, basically <coughs> their lighting equipment in the early days. Uh, the guys carried these, they were filled with oil, had a wick in here for a, for a flame light, and of course hooked it onto their hat or the wall or a beam or wherever. And that was basically what they had to work with and to see with. And uh, of course, you have to wonder if you're carrying around a, you know, that type of a, a lighting system with an open flame and, and there's pockets that you never know if you're going to hit a pocket of gas or what have you, what's going to happen. But that's the, the conditions they had to work with. Um, this is just another uh, a nice view uh, of the mine completed. Uh, the loading bays and tracks for the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad cars. Um, everything by that, that time, uh, in the early years, is up and running. Everything in, in good operation. Um, let's see, uh, in 1908, they also started to uh, uh, sink a second shaft. So they were really uh, um, producing at that time. They were producing uh, 60 to 80 uh, train loads or car loads of, uh, of salt a day all run by the Pennsylvania Railroad. And of course, there's the uh, cars of the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, at the mine. And they, they had the monopoly on it and shipped it all over the country, all over the East Coast. Uh, give you an idea of uh, uh, different types of uh, early operations. Uh, the salt would come up from the shaft. Uh, it would be uh, sorted, crushed, uh, uh, categorized. Uh, this guy, his job, of course, apparently is to keep track and make sure the conveyors are working all right. If you look, this is, this is his <coughs> walkway here. Uh, you have to stay alert on that job, I guess. Uh, down in this bottom picture is the same operation. They have different shoots for different grades of salt to come out and dispense with into barrels or, or bags or whatever process they used uh, at that time. Uh, just a quick uh, close view of the shaft down here in the corner is one of the uh, mine cars that goes in and over to the shaft and down uh, for loading and transporting the salt. Uh, here again, just a group, uh, totally unknown. But just a variety of the different types of immigrant miners. Most of the force, mining force employees were immigrants, not all, but the majority of them were. Uh, as I said, it was never a safe job. Uh, some early newspaper accounts uh, list different. Uh, it seems like every other month there was somebody getting injured or killed, and yet, however, they claim that the salt mine and the Sterling salt mine had the fewest uh, amount of fatalities and injuries as, as normal. But anyways, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, uh, as I said, a lot of the early mining was done by explosives. There was always uh, guys injured or killed by explosives. There were guys on the uh, railroad cars, injuries, uh, uh, steam pipe uh, would blow up or uh, uh, steam scalded to death or uh, even smothered with uh, rock piles and salt piles. Uh, uh, just as a few quick samples of the hazards of the job. And of course, we mentioned about the differences, uh, the ethnic backgrounds, the problems they had in that uh, nature. There was a, in 1921, after World War I, of course, there was a, uh, uh, of course, uh, worldwide uh, concern, if you will, with Bolshevism, uh, the Red Scare, uh, foreigners in general, uh, violence, anarchists, that type of thing. Uh, the sheriff, uh, there's an account that the sheriff of Livingston County decided he had to keep closer track of the uh, foreigners in the county and what they were up to. Uh, so he decided to, uh, one day to visit the Sterling Salt Mine and just kind of check out everybody over there and see what the, uh, 
uh, what's going on, and it turns out that, uh, much to his surprise, nearly every miner he uh, of the force and employees there uh, carried some type of weapon. He had either he was packing a gun or a knife or something. So the sheriff uh, confiscated all of the uh, weaponry there and ended up with quite a collection of uh, an arsenal there. But anyways, uh, um, uh, as I said, uh, just an example of the group. Uh, some of you may have heard. I don't. I uh, don't know anything about it in detail. There was always somebody getting injured and killed uh, over here on the Geneseo side. You may have seen it across the valley at some point. But they claim there is a ghost story associated with the Sterling Mine. Uh, what they call the Blue Lady. They would always see. Uh, some people claim to have seen her in person, but uh, and some people claim it's just uh, escaping uh, gas out of the uh, methane gas out of the mine. But either story version you want to believe, some people claim that the uh, blue lady was a, uh, the wife of a miner with, uh, carrying a lantern searching for her husband who was killed in the mine. So just little odd things like that that you come across and you never know about. Tom? Yes. How many, do you know how many employees they had? <coughs> well, as I said, in the early years, they started with 150 in their peak years. Uh, the best guess I can come up with, they, they peaked at about 250 total. And then, of course, in the later years, it dwindled down somewhat. Uh, just, uh, we're going to get in here shortly, a, uh, uh, some unusual pictures of the mine itself uh, and, and leave the surface here. Uh, this is one of the sheds where they did the bagging operations. The salt, of course, was depending on the grade of salt. It was shipped out by railroad cars, it was barreled, and it was bagged. That, if you can't see it very well under magnification, that's the Sterling Salt Company there. But just one of the uh, everyday jobs the miners had was bagging and weighing salt bags and, and shipping. Uh, another, just uh, some nice pictures, a nice close up view. This is a powerhouse here. And of course, we've seen the three stacks that go with it to the boilers and uh, railroad cars, the uh, box cars, the railroad cars. Yeah. Uh, the interior powerhouse. Uh, in the 1920s, they were able to install dynamos, <coughs> big dynamos over here, uh, steam powered, and they were able to uh, power up the uh, the mine itself and get everything. Uh, switched over to operation in an electric or hydraulic or even compressed air mode. So, of course, that was a big improvement for the, uh, the workforce. <coughs> but, uh, and uh, uh, the dynamos here at the uh, mine produced enough electricity, they were even able to power up uh, like street lights and partial uh, uh, areas of the, uh, the Kyleville uh, village itself. So the, the mine benefited the area and the village uh, immensely uh, in its day. Uh, here again, back to Mr. <coughs> Featherston. He took in, uh, uh, with all the problems that uh, uh, occurred with the mine and the employees, uh, he always tried to uh, uh, make it into a community uh, type environment. He uh, always had uh, uh, picnics, uh, carnivals, uh, all types of school activities uh, to get the miners to uh, cohabitate nicely uh, without choking their guns to the company picnics. <laughs> um, but anyways, they, how many, uh, you know, a, a type of environment uh, of a mine these days, and those days it was also almost a sightseeing type of operation. Uh, they got a couple big touring cars here, they got a bicycle, and they got some ladies over here in their long dresses. They're just uh, roaming the grounds and looking things over and just seeing what goes on at the local salt mine. So, I'm sure they're not playing croquet? Well, I can't <laughs> tell, but it's possible. That's next month's stuff. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll make that next month's stuff. So, anyways, before we get down into the mine, this uh, operation is the... Uh, the shaft room, uh, one of the outbuildings here at the mine. Uh, there's a guy up here. This is an indicator, as I understand it. This is an indicator that tells you the location of the elevator for the mine shaft, where it is at, at any given point. 
Uh, of course, the electric dynamos there, uh, the big cable pulleys that run the uh, elevators up and down in the shaft, uh, another indicator uh, for the other uh, shaft uh, elevator, and uh, just some of the uh, electric, and by that time, electric and steam-powered equipment that uh, operated the mine. So now we're down in the mine itself. This is the, uh, this is the elevator shaft, and over here is the big cable pulleys. And uh, as you can see, uh, in very close quarters down there. Uh, they just mm -hmm. run the electric lights, uh, nothing fancy. Uh, here again, they like to do stuff all over in the way, I don't know. But uh, at least they got electric power down there, makes a, makes a big difference in working in a mine, of course. Uh, this is uh, here again, uh, you look at how tight these quarters are in terms of the ceiling and the uh, the uh, passageways. Uh, it's not a very clear picture, but this is an electric, uh, well, an electric motor car actually, and these are the the salt cars that are to move the salt uh, from the working area of the mine to the shaft area of the mine. But this is uh, a basic your everyday, uh, you know, working uh, environment uh, for a miner. Uh, here again, close quarters, uh, the, the salt cars. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. There's guys on the platform here. Um, but it gives you a good idea of what it was like down in the mine itself. Uh, this guy's job, of course, he's sitting here with the scales, his, his control levers, his desk. He's weighing each individual car uh, to get the, uh, the weight of the, uh, that load of salt so they can tally it up for, for uh, business use there. And, uh, uh, from there, he would send it to okay, uh, uh, a couple of the miners, <clears throat> some of the type of uh, you know, methods they used, uh, the things they dealt with. Uh, of course, this is a little later years. This is probably the 19, I would say the 19, late 1920s, 19, close to 1930 years. Is it cold? They claim the average temperature stayed about 50, 50 degrees down there. Yeah. Um, by 1924, they had a uh, uh, new and improved equipment. They no longer had to uh, deal with mules. They no longer had to deal with picks and shovels and explosives. They had electricity. Uh, this operation here. Um, was built by the Goodman Company. And this, uh, according to the information I've got, this is a new hydraulic shovel that was developed principally, it was the first uh, New York State developed principally for the Sterling Mine and first used here. And how this operated, um, uh, these two are caterpillar treads. Um, this is a bucket and this is an extending arm and that's the other part of the extending arm. And you can't see it well, but this is a, a jack, hydraulic jack. And uh, how it would operate was where he would pick a location, uh, this jack would engage with the ceiling of the mine to give it a, uh, a, uh, a stable, uh, non-moving platform. Uh, this uh, arm would extend out and in, pick up a load of salt. It was capable of lifting a thousand pound loads at a time. And then, because he's got this pivot point with this jack, he could, uh, this uh, machine would uh, pivot around this jack area 360 degrees, and then he could dump it in the cars back here without moving. Uh, next one there. Uh, just a quick idea came out of one of their uh, catalogs here. It tells you how it operated. Um, as I said, the 1,000 uh, pound load of salt, as you can see, uh, this uh, block here would push forward hydraulically and push the load right out of the bucket so there wasn't any uh, uh, dumping or anything of that nature that might endanger uh, anything. And then of course he just lower his hydraulic jack and move on to the next spot and keep loading cars all day. New and improved, boy, it's a far cry from having to break your back every day and shoveling them cars with that salt. Uh, another new and improvement, same type, same year, in this picture is a, uh, a Goodman uh, uh, salt cutter. Uh, up here, it's just like a chainsaw. Up here is a five and a half foot uh, 
tooth blade. Uh, of course, they're built low for the mine. Uh, it's all on railroad tracks. It's uh, run by uh, electricity on a, a, a cable a pulley uh, spool there. And uh, next slide. And this is another illustration of what it looked like and how it operated. Here again, it did away with all the dangers of explosives. Uh, the, the machine would come up on uh, the cable uh, on the uh, railroad track. Uh, it would all flow off of the uh, track, leave the, uh, the uh, cable pulley behind. They would anchor it into a wall, pivot it, drag it up to the edge of the uh, salt block, uh, start cutting away, move it over, number three here, and cut mm -hmm. the entire five-foot section out of a, of a salt line block at once, uh, finish it off on this other corner uh, on the same type of arrangement with the uh, uh, cable and then uh, pull it back to the track and back it off and, and then just uh, uh, work that big salt block uh, section out of there and, and move that out of the way and bring in the lower cars and the, uh, the uh, lower. Of course, there's a section of the uh, cars all over it going to the shaft to be transported up to the ground level. And this is kind of unique. This was uh, the Sterling mine. Uh, of course, in a mine, whenever there's always an emergency at some point, uh, whenever there's a problem, there's an emergency, they had this huge steel rim. And this uh, poor quality picture coming out of a newspaper. And this guy, you can't see it very well. He's standing here with a sledgehammer. So anytime they had to, they didn't have a steam whistle type. Uh, they may have had, I don't know. but. Uh, uh, their idea of any time uh, they needed to uh, get somebody's attention, and they would wrap the hell out of this steel ring. <laughs> and you would said, uh, according to the article, that you could hear it for quite a distance around town. Now, that's one thing that still survives in the Sterling Mine. If you ever go to Kyleville, you know where the big curve is. Well, right off of the curve is the Kyleville Fire Department. And that still stands right outside of the entrance to the Kyleville Fire Department. So you can go over and take a look at it. I wouldn't suggest you take a hammer and go over and wrap on it. But uh, it's kind of a neat thing that's still a relic that survives the really old sterling mine. And he could go play croquet once again with his mallet after. <laughs> anyway, uh, of course the sterling mine were always concerned with safety as they should have been. Always very serious about uh, improving the conditions of the workmen and the, uh, the environment. Uh, the Sterling Mine took and developed a, uh, a mine rescue team. Uh, went through quite a bit of training and quite a bit of competitions around the country. And uh, this is about, this like, again, this is the late 1920s. Uh, I don't have a lot of information about them at the moment, but uh, I'm still working. And uh, just a neat thing to uh, learn about the, uh, you know, they weren't just the, uh, Make uh, use and abuse their employees and their immigrants. They they actually uh, cared about them and, and their safety. So uh, a mine wrestling team was a very commendable effort. Now they had a problem, of course. Like I said, when it worked, it worked fine. But the Pennsylvania Railroad had the monopoly on moving the mine and its production. But they had problems. Uh, some lawsuits were involved, and they. They decided uh, they had uh, the uh, Retzoff mine at that time was developing uh, in operation and expanding and uh, you know coming into its own right. They decided uh, they ought to take and build them a three mile railroad mm -hmm. to go from Kyleville mine over to the Retzoff mine. So in the 1920s, this is what they did. Uh, here they're laying, they've cut and graded all the uh, area. They're laying the ties for this railroad. And uh, of course, that was all done, horse and wagon, man power. Uh, they had a big old steam attraction engine, uh, greater level of beds, and, and cut the uh, uh, flat surface of the, of the uh, land to the uh, to the railroad. Mule teams, of course, over here for hauling and things. And like I said, just one nice shot of the operation. It was the shortest railroad in Livingston County and it made the most money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And not only did they, uh, for a while there, not only did they take and uh, use the railroad to transport salt and salt cars, but they also hitched on a passenger car and made sort of like a, a commuter line out of it between Kyberville and, and Rethoff. They would take freight and uh, people that uh, wanted to go. So that worked out pretty good for them. When it was abandoned, of course, when the mine shut down in 1930, it was no longer needed, and it was abandoned in 1933. They did away with it and tore it all up again. Uh, just a nice winter shot of the mine in full operation, and it's in its heyday here. It's an early shot. Uh, as I said, you can see all the feeder lines of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, there isn't a lot of great pictures of the mine, considering the, uh, the extensive uh, operation it was and how significant it was, but this was pretty much the best of the best. Now, the mine also had a, a miner's village. This is here again at River Road. Uh, this is the salt company. This is Valentino family, uh, Masonis family. All these buildings were all built by the mine, had their own village, and provided for the miners at a reasonable price. Uh, of course, the village is, for the most part, few of the houses remain, but for the most part, the village is gone too. Um, just an idea of the type of houses, the small uh, construction houses. Uh, this is the upper uh, uh, road, uh, river road, I believe. Uh, all basically the same type of uh, construction there. As you can see, it's sort of a cookie cutter type of operation. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, uh, I don't know, and miners go out at the end of their shift and tie one on. I don't know which house they got. <laughs> Desserts. But anyways, I would have had a problem. But anyways, at the top of the hill, they even built, in 1914, I believe, they even built a nice Catholic church for the miners. And predominantly uh, European, Italian, and Italian, Arab Catholic faith. It was a fantastic mm -hmm. church. It was called the Santa Maria de Mercedes. And, uh, uh, of course, like I said, not all the miners were hellraisers. A lot of them were very serious family men, went to church every week, and, and took care of uh, their responsibilities. Uh, it's a fantastic building, a fantastic construction. Uh, of course, it survived after the, uh, the mine closed. Unfortunately, in 1938, uh, in the springtime, uh, people get the idea to go out and burn off their grass lots and such. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And in the process of doing that up there, it got onto the uh, church building. Of course, by that time, it wasn't being used, and mm -hmm. burned it right down, mm -hmm. which to me is a terrible loss because it's just a fantastic piece of uh, our local heritage here. Mm -hmm. They also had in Cotterville, Mr. Radici had the Sterling Inn. The Sterling Inn, of course, as you can imagine, was a boarding house for uh, visitors and dignitaries and whoever <coughs> wandered through. Uh, I started to do, uh, when I initially did this program, I started to tie in the prohibition years for this, but I found that to be too extensive because I haven't got all the material I need yet. I just hit the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Cairo was a really uh, out of control in the prohibition years, but that's another story. Uh, I don't have any concrete information that uh, the Sterling Inn was involved with the illegal alcohol <laughs> But you have to wonder because everybody else in Cairo Villa is. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, by 1930, there was no longer the market for salt uh, that there once was. Of course, this was before the days of uh, widespread uh, salt usage on roads, so there, that wasn't an issue. Uh, in those days, salt was principally used for the tanning of hides, uh, preservation of food, and especially for. The president, you're going oh, back up. <laughs> Arrow buttons. Uh, principally used for one more. Principally used for the preservation of ice, because the rock salt would keep the ice from quickly melting away, and they still could make use of it. But in the 1920s, they developed uh, the system of refrigeration, and. Uh, at that point, of course, uh, if you had things refrigerated, you didn't need ice, ice boxes and such. And if you don't need ice, you don't need salt. So the entire market took a downturn. And because of the Retsoff mine was uh, newer and more modern at that point, there really wasn't anything wrong with the Tyler Sterling salt mine. 
It just was a little older and a little bit less convenient. So they decided in 1930 to close down the mine here and transfer everything over to Redtoff. And they used the mine here principally uh, for storage, or they just let the buildings go to ruin. Uh, you can see one of the storage sheds here in 1942 they had it filled with material and it caught fire and it burned the roof off of it there. Mm -hmm. So uh, as the years went by, the 1940s, 1950s, uh, of course the uh, rents off the salt mine was bought off by International Salt. They decided to take and uh, just start, uh, you know, they weren't going to use it, they weren't going to pay the taxes on it, the assessments. They just started demolishing one building after another until the main cement building was pretty much all that was left. And it was the 1970s when they took and uh, uh, demolished that and took that all down. And a couple of years ago, where the site of the mine was, if you go up on River Road, it was almost directly to the east or across from the uh, Kyleville Gun Club up there. Well, a couple of years ago, I'm not sure exactly all the details, but they had a big operation up there. They took all that land that was the mine and stripped it all off and environmentally uh, resided it and, and took and uh, uh, put new drainage in and just took and uh, uh, obliterated all traces of the uh, Sterling salt mine completely. However, when they closed the mine in uh, the late 1920s, uh, by that time, generations of uh, miners had gone from father to son. Uh, most of them transferred over to the Retzoff mine, uh, continued on the tradition. We've still got the same uh, group of miners working today. Uh, they've done a wonderful thing for our region, our county's benefit. And uh, we appreciate it. We understand and uh, sympathize with all the uh, hardship they uh, had to endure to make a living, to become citizens of the country. But they're still at it today. And that's pretty much the uh, story of the Sterling Salt Mine. <clears throat> What was the accident, Tom? What's that? What was the accident? Then? Well, there were some, I don't know all the details. There was a crew, uh, four or six men of the salt company, who went to inspect the uh, shaft and just uh, see if everything was, uh, you know, a problem of some nature or what was going on. And the building, and as I understand it, one of them kicked, dropped, threw a rock down in the shaft. And when it hit the bottom down there, it sparked something and, and set off a, a huge pocket of gas, which exploded and came right up the shaft and killed two of them, I believe. Joe, Joe Busey's father was Yeah, he was one of them, yeah. Joe Vitale was there, but he was hurt. Yeah. 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 I mean, the elaborate on that story, there was, they had capped, they had capped with a concrete cap the shaft off about 100 feet down, and they wanted to, uh, entirely fill up the shaft. So the first thing they had to do was get rid of that cap. So they had a treble light down in the, in the, as far as the cap. And their idea was to take this huge rock, which is half the mm -hmm. size, well, a quarter of the size of this room, tip it into the shaft with a bulldozer, which they did. And when it went down, it broke through the concrete cap, but just below that was natural gas. Mm -hmm. And the treble light, they exploded the natural gas and everything came flying out of the shed. And all the guys that were around looking down to see what was going to happen saw what happened. 
-hmm. The story is that Joe Vitale, for one person, got blown right straight through a sheet of plywood. But he survived, believe it or not. Then there are several other ones, including a young engineer, I can't remember his name, and, and uh, Gilio, young Gilio, and a whole bunch of fellows that got killed there. Uh, and then they, they eventually succeeded and filled the shaft up, and then they tear, tore down the uh, concrete, the rest of the concrete plant. And then, like you say, just a few years ago, they bulldozed the whole area. There's a big salt pond there now that they use just for wastewater. Uh, but that's the only thing that's left to this building so much. The person um, running the shack that day, his name was Cliff Elger, and he's 98 and a half years old and still living in yeah, yeah, lives Elger, in yeah. Oregon well. States and actually can yeah. tell me about it still. Oh, yeah. Something. Yeah, I remember it well. Well, thank you again. Oh, here's another question. Did uh, Foster, who owned Retsoft, did he also own Sterling? No. At one point, the Sterling Salt Mine bought out the Red Salt Mine. Oh. In the early years, they, they bought the entire operation. And then, as I understand it, like I said, I'm no specialist in salt history. I'm trying to focus on Sterling. And, and it's not easy digging out information. <coughs> Anyways, the uh, International Salt Company eventually bought the whole the operation. Whole right. Everybody. Hmm. Right. So, how many uh, structures are left in daylight? Do you have any? Said there are there's a few houses left. I can't tell you exactly how many. Uh, of course, the sunset time they've also built others. So it would be yeah. a little bit difficult to say this is and it isn't. Was, but there, was there a road in Haylight beyond River Road? Was it just there was a brown road, road that went up yeah, over the top side yeah. and River yeah. Road, and then of course it went up to Caledonia Road, up the further up the hill, and then okay. that turned to go to Brown Road, did you say? Yeah. Is it still there? Yeah. Still oh yeah, it's still there. Well, thank you again, Tom. Thank you. Please indulge in the refreshments back there. Karen, did you have one more thing? I did a project for the salt mine a number of years ago, and after I saw it was here tonight, I was really excited. I did bring, if you're interested in seeing it, one thing that came out of that um, documentation project about in the 2004, 2006, was a log book, an employee log book from the Sterling Salt Mine Company. And it was something that was rescued from the dumpster when <coughs> things were being figured out in 1990. Uh, four. Four, five, 95. Yeah, in there, I went to shutting down. And Joe Busey got his pickup truck and got a bunch of stuff out of the dumpster, files and stuff that were being thrown away. One of these was this big log book that has, I believe, every employee of the Sterling Salt Mine listed in it. And, that, and uh, Joe gave that to the Tom York Historical Society. We had it every single page digitized mm -hmm. up um, in Victor, through mm -hmm. Test Technologies. And uh, we have, so um, I have, actually, if you want to see it, I have a page from the mine from that book if you'd like to look at it. I brought it on, on the drive if you want to take a minute to see that. But it's, um, it's something that's, uh, there's so much really wonderful information on it, and we've been slowly working, very slowly working to get all this information into the database. But there's about 600 pages in this book. And each page has maybe anywhere from 20 to 40 entries on it. And it goes all the way from 1905 to 1930, as near as we can tell. That doesn't look like USB. Lots and lots. Oh, is it this? No, it's here. No, it's here. There. Here, Tom, I'm just going to play around on your computer, okay? <laughs> There you go. There it is. Movable disc. Yeah. It's a PDF. Um, Probably just. Uh, I don't know how to get rid of that. I'll give you something. Um, yeah. 
Which one is it, Ken? Do you want to click it? Can I just get it? Surprise. Well, I just thought, since it was all about the Sterling Mine, I thought it might be fun to look at one of those pages. Um, Sterling Mine. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a bunch, but. Wow. <laughs> oh. so, so here's the complete um, page. So all handwritten, and um, can make it a little bit. So make it a little bit. So that's kind of the overview. Um, let me bigger. So on the left hand side, over here. So there's a number over here, and and in trying to figure out what these numbers mean, this number goes down the page. Um, it goes from let me get a little bit bigger. Thirteen. It goes from 1911 on this particular page. Let's try like 85. Yeah. Yeah. Thirteen. 14. So number 260. From July. Right there. You're going wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. That's great. Oh, good. So that we were thinking that the number goes from 1911 at the top of the page down to 1922. So perhaps it was like an employee number. Maybe when an employee left, we used the number again. Um, it's a little. I haven't quite figured all that out. So you see, age 13. Yeah. Oh, wow. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Time in country, two years, two months. So age, date employed, residence, high level, married or single, children, place of birth. Time and country, and I heard someone say, you know, two years, two months, sometimes it says five days. Mexico City, German, Austria, Angelica, Austria, so many places where we were born. Ritzhoff, Poland, Austria. And then um, age 13, age 13. Uh, so time and country, how much they weighed. Yeah. That 13 year old was 73 pounds. Wow. 19 year old is 140. He's a little, he's a little more well rounded. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, hmm. The place they were last employed, that's really interesting to have. Uh, Around the Great Lakes. Let's make it a little bit bigger like this here. So we'll go over here a little bit. So here's some went to school left. Barge Canal. No. Contract in Chicago. <laughs> Geneva Foundry Company. Coal mine. The Oakfield Mines, I think that's the gypsum mines in Oakfield. Um, There's the jello plant, that's fun. <laughs> and then what's one of the most interesting lines is the remarks. This is very more often uh, when they left. Wow. Much of them no good. <laughs> A lot of things you maybe couldn't write today in your. Um, Good help was how hard to find. <laughs> no, this is this is some employee of mine, and it seems to be the same handwriting for quite a while. And the handwriting changes. So here's why do people leave? Sometimes it says what they did. Um, that 13 year old boy was at the top there, so he probably went back to school. He was a good boy. All right, no good. Sometimes it says things like good but drinks. Stabbed in the oh, house. So <laughs> oh, stabbed in the house. Oh, stabbed in the house. Oh, stabbed in the house. Yeah, died in Harriman Hospital November 14th. So that was, a, that was an interesting one. We, I, I did some work with the kids in New York school and I had to look up that employee and there's newspaper accounts and 
there's a newspaper account about this, names everybody there. It was a party, somebody had an altercation with someone, and this fellow went out to help stop it. He got away, got stabbed by the fellow that started the thing, and then died a couple days later. So that was um, Scroll down a little more. So you did not like something. Resign. Yeah, let me. I'm get a little bit bigger. One it says resign on account of not having enough work every day. Oh, very. Mm -hmm. He did not like working in the mine. Discharge March 30th, 1923, was sick and did not return to work. A lot of them says it didn't return to work after three days, and so they were gone. <laughs> we saw on April 16th, it does not agree with him to work in the mine. <laughs> November 22nd, we resigned. He said that he could not make money enough. <laughs> so actually, it, some of these things, it, it's easier to read when we blow it up like this than it is in the original. <laughs> could not make enough money. <laughs> So in the later years, some of it, there wasn't enough steady work. Uh, I like this one. Wanted to work outside a while. <laughs> but again, here's, here's the names. <clears throat> so we find anybody else. I'm so glad to give it to your uncle. Your great uncle. My great uncle. Great uncle. Great uncle. Yep. Chose the right, right um. age. So... <laughs> As I said, uh, some of these have been, um, there's about 2,700 entries so far in the database, wow. taken from these 600 pages with all of these things on the So the database, you can now start to look up a name. If you have a family name, search by the name, and then see perhaps when they, if it's the person you're looking for, when they were hired. Is this just for the Sterling line? This is this is just the Sterling line. Well, can you find it online someplace? It's not online yet, but um, it's kind of a long-term project of the Historical Society. It's something that we need to ramp up. Um, so yeah, it, it should. We need to make it available somehow. Maybe we can mm -hmm. work with with the county somehow to, to move it along. And it's fascinating to look at the three volumes of it that we have, but there's no way to know where to look or, mm. or how to find somebody. So. Like looking for a needle it's in a haystack. My, grandfa my grandfather worked there. Did he? He, he, was, um, he worked on the Florida Railroad and then he came up here and married a McNair girl from over on the flats and then went to work there as a carpenter. Mm. And he worked there right until he retired from the Red Sox back in the 50s. What was his last name? Van Tyne. And that, that uh, map of Kyla, his mother's house uh, number and everything was right there. And then they had a uh, carriage shop right downtown. And they, uh, Is this at the York, York Historical Society? Yeah. York Historical, York Historical Society. York Historical Society. Yeah. Karen, did you say... Is the ledger, is it entered, it's chronologically, it's not alphabetically by a whole year? No, the, the letter is, is the ledger is from number, that number on the left, uh -huh. number one, number 600 or something. But it's from chronological, that. yeah? Well, yeah. it's chronological on the page. It goes, from the first page is all the number one cell sets, second page is number two, third page is number three. So, in kind of looking to see, if you go across, the nearest we can kind of figure out at this point. So here's number 260 on this particular page. This is the, I don't know what, you know, this is about 260 pages into the book. Um, <clears throat> number 260 was assigned to Percy Holder, July 13th, 1911, was under his employee. So if we go over and see, that's our 13-year-old. He left July 26th. If we go back to the next name on the list, he came April 27, 1912. Mm -hmm. So that number now is assigned to Percy again. Um, <coughs> Could that even be like a locker number or something? Or a tag number. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it seems to be somehow attached to the employee. Because they obviously use the number. So it could be a tag. Yeah, 
I don't know if they still do it in the store yeah, today, but uh, in a lot of mining operations, they use a tag number that they would put on a board when they were going down the line, and it was their number that said they where they were. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's the same number. Because it doesn't seem to be like the exact number of people working in the mine, but it's a number that was reused. So when it became available, it would be reused at some point. Because they, they don't, they barely overlap. You can look to see when someone leaves, then when someone else comes, it's a little bit later than the last person who left under that number. Very high turnover. 260 wasn't a very popular number, was it? <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um,